Well, we've made it to uh, the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation, and it's, it's only taken us 15 messages to get here. So, so we're, we're moving along, and depending on uh, who's preaching, we could be doing very well or not very well. But I, I think we're okay. But I do have a question for you, and, and that is, how are you doing? Uh, as, as I began to... Uh, work on the message today, I kind of felt like my head was going to explode. You get all this stuff going on in there in this book of Revelation. You have to admit, it's a busy book. There's a lot of stuff going on and it's hard, it's hard to follow sometimes. So let's just take a minute and review the ground rules a little bit. Uh, you'll remember that this is poetic, apocalyptic literature. So when we interpret it literally, it means we interpret it literally by the rules of that genre of literature. It's, it's poetic, it's picturesque, it's uh, 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 full of mystery and things. And at the same time, we need to remember that it was a letter written to seven earthly churches. And it was supposed to be something they could understand, something that would benefit them, as well as us all these years later. So we must find some practical application in the book, and I think you've seen that we have so far. I, I hope you've been encouraged, as we've seen a lot of things, bad things happening, but God always prevails, always keeps his people, and protects them. But still, the book is filled with all of these strange and fascinating creatures and, and happenings. And there's mystery. It's all shrouded in mystery. And again, if you're like me, and most of you are, we're westernized, we're western thinkers, and that's a good thing. Uh, we don't do well with mystery. Well, what's the first thing we want to do when we find a mystery? We want to solve it. You know, uh, we, we like reading mystery novels, some of us, but why do we read them? Because we want to we want to find out who did it, you know, or what happened. And so it is with this book. Uh, sometimes we, we're so intent on finding the answer, on solving the mystery, that we completely miss what God is trying to get over to us. Now, thankfully, as we mature in our Christian life, we come to the place where we begin to uh, sort of coexist with mystery, if you will. Uh, we, we, we're still not totally comfortable with it, but we're able to accept it. We're able to deal with it. We're able to say, you know what, God? I don't quite understand what you're doing here. But I know your big picture is you're guiding me down this road to where you want me to be. I had a professor one time uh, in seminary and he, he would say that it did not surprise him that God was so big that he couldn't understand everything about him. What would surprise him if God were so simple that we could? You see, And I thought that was very good. That was, I've kept that in mind over the years. We have seals, we have trumpets, we have thunders, we have vials. What, what is all of this? Now, how many of you have heard of the seven trumpets, or the seven thunders, by the way? We all know about the seven trumpets, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials. But what about the seven thunders? Did you know there's seven thunders in the book, too? Yeah, most people don't, but they're there. We'll get there to them as we, we go along. And they're another mystery all in themselves. Another thing that makes this book so difficult for us is it's history, but it's not all history. It is, talks about things that are going on right now in our present day, but it's not all present. And it talks about things in the future, but it's not all future. And then it talks about them all at the same time. It's difficult for us to grasp because, as, as I say, we are... We are linear thinkers. Uh, when I first became a Christian, one of the first books I ever bought was this one here. And you can tell by the cover, it's been around a while. And uh, this little book, the author was a very humble man. And he titled the book, The Greatest Book on Dispensational Truth in the World. <laughs> Clarence Larkin was his name. And he, and he was a great, great man. But... 
the nice thing, and, and I, I bought into that book. This book, Larkin was an architect who became a Christian. And uh, you, you won't be able to see real well. But this book is just full of these sorts of things. Charts. Full of charts. Everything is explained. Everything you ever want to know. If you want to know, solve every mystery in the book of Revelation, get one of these charts. <laughs> now that appealed to me. That appeals to most of us. Because it settles the issue. And I, I have a slide here. Uh, talking a little bit about this. This is linear thinking. You know, we would say, okay, we've, we've read about the seals, so they happen. And the next thing that happens is the trumpets, and the next thing that happens is the bowls, and it's so nice. It's so tidy. It appeals to me. But unfortunately, I don't think it's right. Actually, it's more like this next slide. <laughs> you see, the green is is uh, the bowl, bowls or the vials, the tea is the trumpets, the blue, and the, the red is the seals. And they kind of start over here and they go like this and they're all messed up. Now, do any of you like that? No. No. It's messy. It's not neat. It's not tidy. All the loose ends aren't tied up. But that's the way this book is. We just have to learn to deal with it. We have to accept it. So, keeping all this in mind, Let's move on here, and we'll see what we've got going here in this eighth chapter of this wonderful book we call Revelation. Let me read for you again what Mike read for us here, the first five verses. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Well, when we finished chapter 7 last week, we were in a very comfortable place. Let me back up to verse 15 of chapter 7. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb is in the midst of the throne. He will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Those are the saints. Those people are us. We just haven't got there yet. Everyone that's died in Christ before us is there. We're not there yet, but we will be there. What a comfortable place. Wouldn't it be nice if the book just ended here? With us having no tears, having no thirst, having no hunger, everything being wonderful beyond imagination. Or it's okay even if it goes on into these first five verses of chapter 8. What a comfortable place. Why can't we just leave it there? You know, that, that's our thinking, isn't it? If God's going to take us to heaven anyway, why didn't he just do it now? Makes sense to me. But God says, not quite yet. Not quite yet. My plan is unfolding. You know, Second Peter in chapter 2. Uh, that's what Peter's explaining to the people. They're, they're wanting to know when the day of the Lord is going to come. And he says, well, don't get anxious. Don't get excited. You know. God is patient until all that he is determined to come to him, come to him. Then the end will come. And remember now, when we talk about the end... Remember our friend Mr. Bonhoeffer. The end for us is the beginning of real life. So when we look to the end, we should look to it with anticipation. As Earl and I were talking before church, this old age thing isn't for wimps, believe me. And so as we look towards the end, we, we run down, we wear out, we have all these problems, and yet, 
the ultimate end is the beginning. And that's what this book is trying to say to us. Now, as, eight, as chapter 8 opens, our focus is still heavenly. And, and what does he say? Now, but we have a new thing introduced here in chapter, in, in verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was what? This is new. There was silence in heaven. Silence in heaven. As you look back, one thing we've talked about is how this book is tied to Old Testament imagery and that sort of thing. And if you look back in the Old Testament, you look to Zechariah chapter 2, verse 13, it says this, says, Be silent all flesh before the Lord. And then one we're, we're all pretty much familiar with is Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. What a change! Here we've had saints praising and uh, elders falling down and people casting crowns and all this uh, exuberant worship going on. And now we're told to be still, be silent, and know that He is God. From passion to a time of silence. As I was reading this, I, I thought about the story in 1 Kings uh, with Elijah. You know, we oftentimes think uh, God is always doing these big things, but sometimes He's doing small things. And if you, if you want to read that, it's 1 Kings chapter 19. And you remember Elijah, is, he's in hiding. And he wants God to speak to him. And so here he is out on this mountain and this, this huge windstorm comes through. Boom! And it says, but God was not in the storm. And then there's this earthquake. The whole mountain shakes. But God was not in the earthquake. And then this huge conflagration of fire. But God was not in the fire. And then it says... There was a still, small breeze, and God was in the breeze. Hmm. Sometimes we just need to slow down. We just need to listen a little bit, to be still. Sometimes we're so busy talking, we don't hear what God is trying to say to us in the still, small breeze. Now, certainly he could be in the wind, he could be in the earthquake, he could be in the fire. And sometimes he shows up that way because it's the only way he can get our attention. But oftentimes it's very subtly he will speak to us. And if you think about your Christian life, think about some of the, the profound things, some of the profound truths you've, know, you've come to appreciate that you came to in just a subtle way. Maybe it was just a word someone spoke, maybe a particular verse you read in a particular context of your life, and you say, oh, I see what that means. So there's a time for loud, exuberant praise, and there's a time for quiet. And I think one of the reasons God says for them to be still at this point in time is we're about to move from the seven seals to the seven trumpets. And the trumpets are more harrowing than the seals were. And as we'll see, the vials will be even more harrowing than the trumpets are. And I think he's saying, as he says to us, stop, focus on me, Listen to me, because you're about to go through some things. And you're going to need to know that I'm taking care of you through these things that are going to come. You know, and all of us, if we live another day or another multiple days, I'm quite sure we're going to go through some things that are uncomfortable, that, that we don't particularly like. And we're going to need to know that God is taking care of it. It's interesting that even Jesus, when he was here, used to take time to get alone with God and just be still. And I'll tell you, that's hard for me to do. I don't like to be still. I like to be doing something. I like to be productive. And we don't understand that sometimes we can be very productive by just being still and focusing on God. Well, now John sees seven angels with seven trumpets. Hmm. Any Old Testament imagery there? 
several places we could go, but the one that really jumps out in me is the story of Jericho. We had seven priests with seven trumpets leading this army, and they marched around Jericho seven times. Now, the first century readers would have immediately went there. They would have immediately caught this, you see. And so, these seven trumpets are going to cause some real havoc on earth. But you think about it, Jericho, they caused some real havoc there too, didn't they? The walls fell down. Now, God's people were victorious, but they had to go through some things before. And I want you to picture this now. You know, it's a neat little story we tell. We read the story. Oh, yeah, this is cool. But think about it. These people had just come from 40 years in the wilderness. They had fought a couple of different countries. They had won the battles. They were a hard, grizzled army. And now Joshua calls the generals in and he says, Okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. God's told me we're going to march around Jericho seven times. And then the last day we're going to do it again. And we're going to blow the trumpets and the walls are going to fall down. Come on, Joshua, you've got to be kidding me. We're warriors. We, we want, let's take the city. What are you talking about? Well, he convinces them to do it. So here they are now, these guys, these victorious, battle-hardened warriors, and they're walking around this, this city. Well, now what do you think the guys on the walls are doing? They're up there saying, Ah, what are you bunch of Nancys? Look at you. You won't even attack us. You're out there marching around, yeah, blah, 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 you know. It had to be terribly insulting for them. They had to be convinced that God had this thing in hand, and somehow it was going to work out. And isn't that the way our lives are so many times? You know, he has us doing something, and we don't have any idea how this thing's going to work out, and we wish we wouldn't have to do it this way, but if we stay with the course, we do it his way, eventually the walls fall down. Now, when I was a kid, we belonged to a certain denomination that was a little more exuberant than we are here. And they would actually have Jericho marches in the church. And everybody would get up and they'd march around and around inside the sanctuary and then they'd blow their horns. And as a little kid, I always was a little concerned. Because I thought, my goodness, what if the walls fall down? But fortunately, they never did. But it was fun to do anyway. Um, so here we have these seven trumpets, so we know God's going to do something. And now John, as he sees these angels holding these trumpets, they know something is going to happen. So, what do we see here? And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Well, what are these prayers? These are the prayers from the martyrs we met back in chapter 6. You remember, they were, they were saying to God, How long, O Lord, before you make things right? And you remember, God's response was, Just chill your heels a little bit. I'll make things right, but not yet. And haven't we all prayed that prayer? You know, God, why don't you just come back right now and solve all this stuff? And he says to us the same thing he says to them. I'll get it, but not yet. Be patient. Not another one of my strong suits, by the way. As probably with some of you. So God hears their pleas and answers their prayers. Verse 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. This is not good news. Especially if you're on the earth. You've got all this stuff going on and coming down on you. Now, the scene shifts back to earth. And we have verses 6 through 13. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. 
The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown down upon the earth. And the third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Then I looked. And I heard an angel crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that their three angels are about to blow. Now as the seals were divided into groups of four and three, you had the four horsemen and three, so these seven trumpets are four and three. And the three woes we will get to another day. A note here, though, the trumpet judgments, like the seals, come from whom? God. Right? Who do we often think everything bad comes from? Satan. One of the mysteries of Christianity is that God uses evil sometimes to advance his program. Now that's a mystery. Like the Trinity is a mystery. You, you want to do a futile exercise sometime, try to explain the Trinity. The, the, more, the more you try, the further you get away from it. It's impossible. Our finite minds aren't equipped. We, can, we believe it. We accept it, but we can't define it. So many things about the Christian life that we don't understand. So th these trumpets, these angels, come from God. But, but, but we don't like that. We want to think, well, love is God. But that's not what Scripture says, is it? It says God is love. And true love, God's love, is perfect, and therefore it's different than our idea of love. Our idea of love is to keep everything we love from ever facing any harm, right? If, if we had it in our power, all of us would raise our children, and they would never be sick, nobody would ever punch them in the nose, they'd never get a bad grade, but we don't have the power to do that, do we? No. And so we have that old conundrum, if God is good, why does he allow evil? And the answer is very simple and very straightforward. I don't know. <coughs> you can explain it, you can chase it all around the bush. I've read a dozen books about it. I don't know is the only honest answer that I can give you. As Paul said, is there any injustice with God? May it never be. John's original audience would understand this imagery well. All this blood and thunder and fire and stuff. You know, he's, he's writing to the real churches with real people. They wouldn't have had so much trouble equating that to their lives. You see, this book was written, I believe the proponents of the evidence shows, sometime during the reign of Nero, which would make it somewhere between uh, 54 and 60, I want to get my date right, 62, 63, somewhere in 68 AD. And Nero was not a good guy. 
There was all kinds of persecution going on. They were struggling. You remember when we read these seven uh, letters to the, the churches? Uh, they were suffering persecution. They were having all kinds of problems. And so they would understand it. The Roman Empire, you see, we read about it and, and we kind of skim across the top. And we think, man, this powerful empire, they had it together. They did not. Rome was a mess. Rome had the most powerful, efficient army in the world. Nobody could stand up against the legions. They had some of the best generals ever. The empire was a mess because of their leadership in Rome. Huh. What country can I think of that might be like that? I can think of a contemporary application. The leadership was a mess. I mean, you, you think about it. In uh, 68, Nero commits suicide. Uh, his predecessor, Claudius, poisoned in 54 by his fourth loving wife, Agrippina. You know, his predecessor, Caliglia, was just a, a, a raving idiot. Tiberius, before him, was pretty good for a while, but when he got old, he didn't have sense enough to retire, and he went off the deep end. They just had one crummy leader after another. So, 68, Nero commits suicide, and 69 is the year of four emperors. Now, you start going through leadership that quick, you've got problems. You got a guy named Galba, followed by a guy named Otho, followed by Vitellus, and they're all idiots. And the country's falling apart. So you've got Vespasian, who has his legions over in, in what's now Israel, and he's putting down a Jewish rebellion. And he and, the, and the, the army says, this is enough of this stuff, Vespasian, you go back there and you take over. So he stops. This is why Titus is the guy that destroys Jerusalem. Titus, Vespasian's son. So he halts the advance of the legions. And it's interesting, too, as you think about it. The temple is destroyed in 70 AD, right on time with God's timeline. Now, if Vespasian wouldn't have stopped and went back to Rome to take over, it would have been destroyed too soon. God wanted it destroyed. On 70 AD. So the legion stops, Vespasian goes back, leaves his son Titus in charge, and the rest is history, as they say. But the Roman Empire was a mess. Other than the army, which functioned quite well. Huh. Can't imagine such a thing. But the people were not to be paralyzed with fear. Even though all this is going on around him. Uh, a little quote here from Johnson's uh, commentary. Such traumas were and are merely instruments in the hand of the Lamb, exposing the emptiness of human arrogance and summoning the nations to repentance. But we look back to chapter 6 and we say, well, Geez, we already had these horsemen and everything. He's, he's already destroyed so much stuff. And now there's even more. But God is trying to get people to wake up. He's trying to get their attention. Because even among the elect, some of us are so stubborn, we have to be hit over the head for him to get our attention. In Romans 8, Paul talks about how all creation groans under the curse, longing for Christ's return. That's why your life is so hard. That's why you have these struggles. Because it's not just us, it's not just humanity that suffers under the curse. It's all creation. Everything is turned upside down. But the thing to remember is these seals, these trumpets, these vials are not time signals. They're the call of God calling mankind to repentance. 
As with the seals, the trumpet visions portray limited disasters in the midst of history. And that's hard for us to grasp. It, it goes like this. But there is a progression. But it is this. We read here that when one trumpet blows, a third of this is gone, and a third of that's gone, and a third of something else is gone. Well, what happened with the seals? When one seal, there was a fourth of this, a fourth of that, a fourth. So now we've gone from a fourth to a third. When we get to the vials, it will be unlimited destruction. So, something to look forward to, huh? Good. But we have to remember, those that know Jesus Christ as their Savior have been sealed unto the day of redemption. So we may go through some real tough stuff. We may even die. But what is death for us? The beginning of real life. It's hard for us to grasp. It's hard to wrap your mind around, but that's the truth. The purpose of the trumpet cycle is to sound the alarm, warning the complacent and calling them to repentance. So as we look at these trumpets, notice how they evoke images of the exodus where God delivers his people. Now you remember here, God says that he hears the prayers of his saints. They're going up to him like incense. What do we find in Exodus chapter 3 verse 7? God's talking to Moses. He says, I have surely seen the suffering of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry. I know their sufferings. And he's going to deliver them, isn't he? And how is he going to deliver them? He's going to send some very devastating things upon the earth, isn't he? See the parallel? See the roots of this book back there in the very beginnings? So let's look here. The first trumpet, verse 7. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And they were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Now, does that mean he took the earth and made it like a pie chart and a third of this and everything and this third? Was, no, does not. But it means there was a lot of damage. There was a lot of devastation. And, and the imagery looks back to Exodus, doesn't it? We, 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 have, we have here uh, fire and things thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. What happened to the Nile and the water in Egypt? It became blood, one of the plagues, you remember? So we, we have some, some parallel things going on here. Back to Jesus. Matthew chapter 21. What did he say? He said, "You will, there will be wars and rumors of wars. And what do we have when we have wars? we have bloodshed, you see. Hmm. Burning is an ancient strategy of war. You don't have to read about very many wars. You find out they burned a lot of things. One of the things is you burn the enemy's crops. You burn his fields. You, you want to, and what does that cause? It causes famine. They starved to death. Ooh, you, can, you thinking about our horsemen again? You remember our horsemen? Bringing all this same stuff. Well, here it is again. The same thing. Uh, it goes on and on. Blood symbolics of violence. And with all of this comes, as we said, famine and starvation. So then we have the second trumpet. Verse 8 and 9. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Doesn't sound good to me. The first trumpet affected the land. The second trumpet affects the sea. And the mountains are thrown into the sea. If you go back and read in your, the Old Testament, you find out that mountains are often symbolic of great nations. So great nations are going to be brought down. A third of the sea is going to be disrupted. Now you read it specifically in Jeremiah chapter 51. Babylon is referred to as a great mountain 
and it's destroyed. And, and what about the sea? What would the people in the first century think about a disruption of the sea? Well, Rome was dependent upon the sea. Its food, its grain, everything came by the sea. If commerce was disrupted, they're going to starve. And it's interesting, I was listening to something on the radio just the other day. I think it was on OPB. It's not my favorite station, but sometimes they have some good stuff on there. And they were talking about the fact that uh, if the United States didn't have the Navy it has, which essentially keeps the seas open, the shipping lanes open for everybody, commerce would fall apart. And if you think about it, that's true. And it's not that we're out there sinking other ships, it's that we have the ability to do that, therefore, most of the other folks behave. You have a few rebels every once in a while, but most of them behave. And if we didn't, if the world didn't have that going on, commerce would all be disrupted. Not a good thing. The third trumpet, verses 10 and 11. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. And Wormwood makes water bitter, bitter, undrinkable, and so on and so forth. Again, a first century audience would have immediately recognized this. It was another well-known tactic in the course of a war. Uh, Oftentimes in war, rather than an open field battle, one army would besiege a city, right? And the point of besieging a city was to cut it off from food and water and you starve them into submission. Well, if you can cut off their water, it's a lot quicker because you can't go very long without water. And the people would have immediately recognized this. And they would have thought, I'm sure, their minds would have went to Hezekiah's tunnel. If you want to read about Hezekiah's tunnel, 2 Kings uh, chapter 20. And it's all in there. And what Hezekiah's tunnel was, it, it was an engineering marvel. The tunnel, and it's still there today. You can go to Jerusalem and see it. 1,700 feet long. And what it was designed to do, and what it did very well, was it brought water from way out here, 1,700 feet away, into the city underground. So it couldn't be disrupted or cut off. Wonderful plan. Wonderful plan. However, <laughs> as with all of our wonderful plans, it had one glaring flaw. And if you um, fast forward up to the book of Daniel, chapter 5, and that's where we have the story of the handwriting on the wall. You know, and what do we have there? Now, uh, Israel's been defeated. And uh, the Babylonians are in there, and Belshazzar is the king, and he's having his big uh, riotous party, you know, and the handwriting on the wall, and they get all focused on that. But uh, what was going on that nobody was paying any attention to, Darius is out here with the Persians, and the Persians are pretty competent engineers themselves, and they figured out a way to divert the water. Well, they didn't divert the water to starve them into submission. What happened that night? Remember Daniel when he interpreted the thing? He said, your lives will be taken tonight. Well, the Persians disrupted the water while the Babylonians are in there partying. Come through the tunnel and take over. And that's how they got there. So water is very significant to these folks and they would have caught this right away. So the fourth trumpet blows. The fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of the light might be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining and likewise a third of the night. It's a good place for us to note John's stylistic use of repetition or what we call recapitulation. This cannot be consecutive after the seals. Because if it is, it's wrong. Because what does he say happens here? He says, a third of the stars fall, blah, 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 blah. But, if we look back to chapter 6, 
verses 12 and 13, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth. And he goes on. So there was no more stars. And yet now we have stars again. So you see how these things are running simultaneously with one another. And they just keep increasing in intensity. And that's hard for us to keep our minds around. Or at least it is for me. And what about all this darkness? Well, could the darkness be from the smoke of burning cities, maybe? Could be. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Yeah, but it's not good. I know that. So what do we get from all this happy stuff that we've talked about today? Are you really built up and encouraged by knowing all this now? Yes. <laughs> good. Because <laughs> that's the point. We still have many unanswered questions. And you know what? Until the day we step into heaven, we're going to have unanswered questions. We can make up answers. And we might even convince ourselves that they are the answers. But they're not. I don't think God intends for us to have the answers here on this earth. It would have been very easy for him to give them to us. But he chose not to in his judgment, which is perfect. But here's what we do have. We know that God's righteous judgment falls on the entire earth sooner or later. Now, that sooner or later part, as I think of that certain unnamed country, it kind of reminds me of Rome, may think it's doing pretty well. Because it hasn't really been affected by this judgment that's falling. Because right, remember, this quarter of the earth, third of the earth, doesn't fall on the entire earth all at once. Which is something to think about. As we move on, these last judgments begin most likely, as we've talked about, either at the cross or at the fall, right? And they've been falling on the earth ever since. Remember? Has there ever been a time when there's not been war? Rumors of wars? No. And we see it all you got to do in the news, you know? Six months ago, well, a month ago, how many of you would have said Russia's going to invade the Crimea? Nobody. But it's always going on. And it's going to go on until the Lord returns. Good news. God has sealed his people. That's you and I. And he sealed us into the day of redemption. We are guaranteed of our salvation. The big picture of Revelation shows a continual and physical spiritual conflict. From the time of the fall until the time of Christ's return. That conflict's going to continue. And sometimes it's going to be very intense. And sometimes you're going to be engaged in it physically. Sometimes you're going to be engaged in it spiritually. But you are going to be engaged in it. And sometimes you're going to win the battles. And sometimes you're going to lose the battle. But you don't lose your seal. You don't lose your guaranteed place in heaven. Okay. Because it's guaranteed by Jesus. He purchased it. He bought it. He paid for it. It's a done deal. Here's the bad news. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, it doesn't make any difference how many battles you win. You may think you win them all. Every investment you make may turn out to be golden. Your health may be perfect. You may have the most wonderful marriage. You may have everything going for you. And you're going to hell when you die. Now that's hard. That doesn't make sense. That's a mystery to me. But that's God's word. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, now's the time to do that. And I'm going to give you a minute to do that as we close. You can just bow your head with me and just pray a simple little prayer. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I want you as my Savior. And you're in. You're a member of God's kingdom forevermore. Pray with me. Lord, thank you that your book is a realistic book. It's not 
full of pie in the sky, everything's going to be wonderful if we're Christians kind of things, that all we have to do is look at our experience to know would not be true. It's a book that says life is hard. The effects of the curse extend around the entire world. And that your righteous judgment is falling on the entire world. And sometimes it's going to affect us, your people. And yet you tell us to be of good cheer. Because you have overcome the world. And you're going to take us to be with you forevermore. And Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, now is the time. If they just in the quietness of your heart, just ask Him. And it's done. You step into the kingdom of God. It's a wonderful thing. Your future is secure. Your death will be the beginning of true life. And now, Lord, thank you for this time, for knowing that you have indeed overcome the world. And that you are our lion, our lamb, our shepherd, our king. We praise you forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen.